All right, welcome everyone uh, to the talk Beyond Namespaces, Virtual Clusters are the Future of Multi-Tenancy. I'm Lucas and I'm the CEO of Loft Labs. And uh, I'm based in San Francisco, but originally from uh, Germany, so, you know, excuse the funny accent. Um, <laughs> Together with my team, we're working on some really exciting uh, things in the Kubernetes space. Uh, our commercial product, Loft, uh, essentially enables large companies you know, to uh, provide self-service, isolated namespaces to a large number uh, of engineers, really like an internal provisioning platform for Kubernetes. So we really care a lot about multi-tenancy, um, about user experience, developer experience, and about self-service. And because we care so much about these topics, we're also heavily involved in open source. We're working on four different open source projects. Our oldest project uh, is called DevSpace. It's a developer tool for Kubernetes, and it's essentially a replacement for Docker Compose that is designed to be you know, for Kubernetes um, that you, you know, can you know, streamline your workflow with Kubernetes the same way as you can do with Docker Compose with your local Docker daemon. But now you can also do that with a remote Kubernetes cluster. We're also working on Kiosk, which is a multi-tenancy extension for Kubernetes, um, and on JS Policy, which is a policy engine that allows you to write policies in JavaScript or TypeScript, making it much easier you know, to write these policies and maintain them over a long period of time, even where someone you know, in the company leaves that you know, was the Rego expert um, writing policies beforehand. And one of the projects that we're working on uh, is vCluster. And that's what we're actually going to talk about uh, today. It's a really, really exciting project around virtual Kubernetes clusters. So let's dive in. Beyond namespaces, virtual clusters are the future of multi-tenancy. Gosh, that's a pretty heavyweight title, right? I don't even know why you're, you know, why you're attending this session. The future of multi-tenancy. Ooh, wow. <laughs> What's that, right? Uh, virtual clusters, never heard of that. Um, you're probably all here because of the first part, right? Beyond namespaces, right? You know namespaces, yeah, I got this, right? Um, I think everybody attending KubeCon probably knows what a namespace is. But do you really know what a namespace is? If we actually ask Google, what is a Kubernetes namespace? I mean, you know, Google came up with Kubernetes after all, right? So let's just take a look. And if we go to the Kubernetes documentation, it reads there, Kubernetes supports multiple virtual clusters backed by the same physical cluster. These virtual clusters are called namespaces. So namespaces are virtual clusters. Dang, we don't even need this talk, right? <laughs> it's built in in Kubernetes, you all know about it. Uh, I guess we're done here, right? If you ask me, uh, this is pretty outdated. Um, namespaces are not clusters. So they're not virtual clusters. Namespaces, and that's also part of the documentation, provide a scope for names in Kubernetes, right? For your pods, et cetera. Names of resources need to be unique within a namespace, but not unique across namespaces, right? So I can have two deployments called database, and they live in two different namespaces, and I don't have any naming collisions, right? Uh, that's great. That's what namespaces do, and that's about it, right? They don't do a lot more, but as we all know, a Kubernetes cluster is much more than just you know, naming objects. So what is a cluster? Not all objects are in a namespace. There are a lot of cluster-wide resources. They include nodes, persistent volumes, and even namespaces themselves, right? Namespace is a cluster-wide resource. If you actually want to check out which resources are cluster-wide and which ones are namespaced, uh, you can actually ask kubectl, right? You can run kubectl API resources, and you can either use the flag namespace true or namespace false to get the respective resources, and Kubernetes will tell you all the resources in your cluster that are available. Hands up if you're a Kubernetes contributor. There's a couple, yeah, a couple more. So this slide is not for you. Because we heard earlier, um, you know, Stephen Augustus in his keynote was talking about we need help with uh, documentation in Kubernetes. That docs page that I was showing earlier in particular, you know, that sentence about virtual clusters is over five years old. 
It hasn't been touched pretty much since the inception of Kubernetes, right? Um, and we, you know, really a lot of people need to, you know, get involved to actually, you know, maintain this vast set of knowledge that we're building in the, you know, Kubernetes documentation. So after this talk, everyone should know the differences between namespaces and virtual clusters and should be able to fix this. And whoever is a first time contributor to the documentation uh, fixes this, uh, will get some kind of a little surprise present from me. Um, so pay close attention to this talk and hopefully, you know, there's an edit uh, page button directly on the docs page, right? Just Google Kubernetes namespace, head to the docs, open that pull request on GitHub. But let's get back to the topic, multi-tenancy, why are you even here, why should you care? Well, in my opinion, spinning up thousands of single tenant Kubernetes clusters is a really terrible idea because it's very, very costly and it's very, very hard to manage. Just imagine you're spinning up a Kubernetes cluster for a thousand engineers, right? And they're spread across like, you know, 200 teams. You're gonna end up with 200 clusters per team or even a thousand clusters if you provision one for each individual user. And none of these clusters really is gonna scale down to zero. And then you gotta maintain things like ingress controller, cert manager, Prometheus, metrics, all of these things, right? In all of these clusters, that's a lot of work and it's really, really hard to keep in sync. And what happens if someone breaks a cluster? Throwing away a cluster, recreating that, Typically, you know, the user, the, the actual engineer who, you know, wants to just connect this Kubernetes cluster to the CI-CD pipeline or just do some, you know, pre-production development work there, doesn't have the permission to destroy a cluster and recreate it. It's pretty tough. So what about namespaces? Can't we use multi-tenancy, create shared clusters, and essentially separate things by namespaces, right? That's the alternative. And a lot of people are doing that today. If we're comparing those two approaches, we see that um, you know, namespaces have a lot of advantages. They're much cheaper. It is much easier to share resources, like for example, you know, a shared ingress controller for all our tenants in this shared cluster. But a lot of other things are, are really problematic, like isolation of tenants, right? As we saw earlier, a virtual cluster is essentially you know, just a naming strategy, right? A scope for our names. That's about the isolation level that a namespace provides. So we need to add a lot of things like network policies, RBAC, right? We need to really lock these namespaces down so our tenants can't get out of there and actually you know, bring the cluster down or harm another tenant, uh, et cetera. And that's a lot of work. And if we're doing it well, then we're restricting that, that very same tenant that now cannot do certain things, right? So let's say there's a team in your organization that needs five namespaces and needs to do you know, things across five namespaces. But you set up network policies in each namespace to lock the traffic down to that particular namespace. Now you've got to make exceptions for that team. And who's going to clean up these exceptions later on, right? It's a pretty big mess uh, when you're using namespace-based multi-tenancy. So if we're comparing those two approaches, you know, separate clusters for each tenant versus multi-tenant uh, clusters and separate namespaces for each tenant inside these uh, uh, multi-tenancy clusters, um, then we see, you know, that the benefits and the downsides are kind of like opposite on both sides, right? Um, a lot of times, you know, we see, we see problems like that. Can't we just get the best of both worlds? That's what we're trying with Virtual Cluster and with our implementation vCluster. vCluster is an open source project. You can access it on vcluster.com. You can find it on GitHub. And it tries to be a multi-tenancy solution um, for Kubernetes that is, you know, beyond namespaces. It is more extensive than what a namespace offers, but at the same time, it is as lightweight as a namespace. So let's take a look at what that means. What do I mean when I talk about virtual clusters? Uh, for me, a virtual cluster is a control plane that runs inside another Kubernetes cluster. What is a control plane? Well, there's an API server, Kubernetes API server, there's a data store where our you know, namespaces, pods, et cetera, are stored in. Uh, that's typically at CD. Then we have a controller manager which controls our replica numbers. If I create a deployment with you know, five replicas, you know, someone's gonna create these five pods. That's what the controller manager does. And then there's a scheduler which then takes these pods and assigns them to nodes to actually you know, where the keyboard starts these containers for us. Um, 
And then we have the workloads on top of these control planes. And typically, you know, we want to create a namespace, we want to create some pods in there, we want to create a couple of other namespaces. Um, and then what we always do is we talk to this API server, right? That's our gateway to Kubernetes. That's our, you know, single source of proof in a way, right? Um, so if we're thinking about virtual clusters that run on top of another cluster, and we have the capability to spin up workloads inside namespaces, then why not create a control plane that runs as a pod inside a namespace of our cluster? That's what a virtual cluster is. That means we have an API server and potentially a couple of other components, and it really depends on you know, your you know, attitude towards virtual clusters and your, you know, how you technically want to implement this, but you're certainly going to need some kind of entry point that you talk to. Um, so now we're not talking to that API server of our real cluster anymore. We're talking to this API server up here. So when I run a kubectl command, I talk to a pod, right, uh, that runs a separate API server. So let's take a look at, at how this actually uh, works. Um, I recorded this demo, and we'll create uh, a namespace in you know a local, let's say, minikube cluster. Uh, we call it host namespace because it's supposed to host our virtual cluster. Um, and then we're using vCluster CLI, uh, which is a very lightweight binary, to create a virtual cluster. We call it VC1, and we tell it, create it in host namespace, right? This is our namespace. Um, we see that vCluster under the hood executes a Helm command, uh, but you don't even need that. You could just run kubectl apply or create a customization out of it, right? Uh, but for ease of use, you know, just you know, running Helm under the hood, pulls a chart, deploys it to your cluster. And then we run recluster uh, connect vc1 and specify our namespace again. Um, and what this does, and you see that here in the output, it actually starts uh, kubectl port forward to now connect to this API server, right? And the second thing that it does, uh, and that's why the you know, CLI is pretty handy to get started with virtual clusters over just you know, using kubectl, it also creates a kubeconfig file in our current working directory. So I split the terminal here, and I'm exporting the kubeconfig environment variable so that all my kubectl commands now point to that virtual API server and not to my real cluster's API server. So any kubectl command I'm running now is inside the virtual cluster. So let's you know, just list all namespaces, and we'll see um, there's a couple of namespaces in there, like kube system and default, and they've been created 51 seconds ago when we started that virtual cluster. We can also list pods in the kube system namespace, and we may not even have the permission to do that in the underlying cluster. We're not admin in the underlying cluster. We just have access to a namespace, and now we're admin in this virtual cluster. That means we can also create namespaces in that virtual cluster, solving you know, our problem with network policies. I can now do things across 10 namespaces, although I just have access to one namespace in the underlying cluster. And of course, I can you know, schedule workloads. And that's actually the tricky part, right? Creating a namespace is just an entry in you know, etcd or our data store. Um, but what happens if I you know, create a deployment, Nginx in this case, uh, I set the replica number, uh, the two, and I schedule that in our newly created virtual namespace, NS1. If we list the pods for this deployment um, a second later, we see that they actually get scheduled um, the first pod is still creating, and the second one is already running. But where is it running, right? That's the question, and I'm going to dive a little bit into this. We'll see, you know, both of them are running now. Our virtual cluster seems to function like a regular Kubernetes cluster. And that's really the goal with virtual clusters. So let's recap about, uh, of what happened here uh, you know, from an architecture perspective. Um, we created this host namespace in our regular Kubernetes cluster. And then we deployed a virtual cluster with the vCluster CLI for ease of use, right? A virtual cluster has mainly two components. It has a stateful set. We call that VC1, just like the virtual cluster we created. And it has a service. The stateful set. Um, essentially you know, creates a pod. It has replica number one in this case. Um, and inside this pod is really where our virtual cluster lives now. Um, we have two containers in this virtual cluster. 
the first container is a control plane. It has an API server, as we talked about earlier. That's definitely what we need to you know, do any kind of kubectl interaction. And it has a separate controller manager. And it has a separate data store as well. So it has a separate state from the underlying cluster to store our pods, namespaces, and everything we do inside the virtual cluster. And then the third component is the so-called syncer. And that is what is replacing the scheduler. You may have noticed, you know, our control plane is incomplete. The scheduler is missing. Instead, we're going to have the syncer. And we're going to talk about this in a second. Um, Next part of the demo was essentially running vCluster Connect, which establishes this port forwarding connection through this uh, vCluster service so that we can now talk to our vCluster API server. And this API server is, uh, vCluster is a certified Kubernetes distribution. It just recently became a certified distro. It's a very new project. We just launched it in Q1 uh, this year and very recently became certified. That means this API server that we're talking to is 100% you know, compliant uh, with all the you know, conformance tests that we have in Kubernetes. And it behaves one-to-one -one like a regular Kubernetes cluster. You won't be able to tell the difference, except you know, I guess after this talk, you should be able you know, to know some tricks on how to find out uh, if it's actually a virtual cluster. Um, so let's get rid of our underlying cluster and just focus on the virtual cluster for a second. Let's get rid of this underlying control plane. Um, the first thing I ran in this demo was creating a namespace. All right, right, that's an entry in our data store. By default, uh, vCluster is using SQLite uh, because it's a very, very lightweight data store. And by default, we're using K3S's API server, which supports SQLite uh, as a storage backend. But you can also use you know, Postgres or even etcd if you need you know, a full-blown virtual cluster. And you know, we are currently working with K3S, but we're also working on you know, making real Kubernetes API server work with vCluster as well. It's one of our next steps. Um, so we're creating a namespace, so that creates an entry in our data store. Um, and then the next thing uh, we saw in the demo was creating a deployment with replica number two. right? So we have another entry in our data store. That's it. right? That's all we're doing with the API server. And then the controller manager, part of our virtual control plane, sees that new entry, right? Gets notified, is listening on these objects, and sees, okay, replica number was two, I create two pods. What does that mean? Well, it just writes two more objects into our data store. So we have four objects in our separate virtual cluster state now. We have a namespace, um, we have a deployment, and we have two pods that you know, are owned by this deployment. Um, and you know, in the beginning, these pods are just, you know, they're, they're waiting to be scheduled, right? They're nothing more, they're just an entry in a data store. And now that's part of the scheduler to actually schedule these pods to nodes. Um, but in a virtual cluster, instead of the scheduler, we have the syncer. And that's actually what makes it really, truly virtual. What the syncer does is it copies the pods from within that data store that we have inside the virtual cluster to the underlying host namespace so that the host cluster's scheduler can now schedule these pods, right? That means all the restrictions we have in terms of network policies, what we have in terms of um, you know, RBAC, anything we have um, in terms of service accounts being mounted into these, um, into these uh, you know, pods, and all these things can be restricted by the underlying cluster. You can have regular admission control, right? Everything is still enforced, but only at the pod level. The deployment doesn't exist inside the underlying cluster, only the pods. And because we can obviously create multiple namespaces in our virtual cluster, uh, you know, what about naming conflicts, right? Um, we were just talking about that earlier, namespace you know, being the scope for names. How do we solve that? Well, what the syncer does uh, when it syncs from multiple namespaces down to a single namespace in the, in the host cluster, uh, it actually renames these pods. And it adds a suffix with the virtual namespace, in this case, NS1 for both of these pods, and even with the name of the virtual cluster, because we could have just like three stateful sets with a virtual cluster inside the same host namespace, right? Um, so we need those two uh, suffixes. Um, and it's really important to understand that Syncer only syncs the minority of things, right? Very, very few things, mainly pods. Um, so Syncer syncs only low-level resources. 
uh, that includes pods plus everything that pods need to start, right? So we typically take a look at that pod in the syncing process and we see, hey, there's a config map that is mounted. So we'll sync that config map as well, but the other 5,000 config maps don't need to be mounted. Um, same for secrets, of course, and same for persistent volumes. Um, we also sync services to make service-based communication possible. Um, and there's two optional uh, sync resources, which are also really basic resources in Kubernetes, uh, and that's ingresses. We added that because there's a lot of need for like shared ingress controller across different virtual clusters, right? Uh, so this is actually by default on in the cluster, but you can disable it uh, with a flag pretty easily. Um, and then the question is, yeah, what are the nodes inside that virtual cluster, right? What if I run kubectl there, get nodes? That's actually up to you as configurable because Syncor syncs in both directions. It doesn't just sync pods down, it also syncs the status up that's why we saw earlier, you know, one of these uh, pods was container creating and the other pod was already running, right? And we saw that inside the virtual cluster, although that state actually lives in the underlying cluster because that's where these pods are being scheduled. And it's really important to understand that those are only, you know, very, very, very few resources in our Kubernetes cluster. All higher level objects are not being synchronized. Only very basic resources are being synchronized. And high-level resources include everything that is replica controlled, right? Um, deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, um, all these you know, secrets and config maps which have nothing to do with pods where we just store some kind of state, um, service accounts, jobs, you know, a lot of these things are not synced. And most importantly, CRDs and the custom resources that we create from them. And that actually creates a really interesting possibility. If you want to install uh, Helm chart today, you know, any kind of machine learning framework, it, there's a very high probability that you will need to add CRDs to your cluster. But if you're not cluster admin, you can't do that because CRDs are cluster-wide resources. But in your vCluster, you can do that. And the great thing is we're shifting left, right? We're shifting uh, this permission and also the responsibility for these CRDs to the application-specific teams that actually care to work with these uh, custom resources. Um, and that's really great for IT teams because the underlying clusters can be pretty dumb. You know, they, need a, they don't need any CRDs, right? They may need to add an ingress controller there and some basic monitoring for these pods that we're scheduling and obviously some network policies, right? But we don't need anything specific to applications. We are not going to run into any conflicts with CRDs either, right? Two teams can have two versions of CRDs and run side by side in the same host cluster, but within two virtual clusters. Very, very interesting. So the vast majority of resources uh, exists only in the scope of our virtual cluster. So what about pod networking and DNS? Well, pod to pod communication is a given, right? Pods are actually running in the underlying cluster, so they can communicate via IP just as they can in a normal cluster. Pod to service communication, as we heard earlier, we by default sync services and we do, you know, wire them up to the actual right pods, right? So that works out of the box uh, as well because the syncer takes care of this. Um, and then what about uh, cluster or vCluster internal DNS? Well, uh, as you may have seen earlier, when we listed the cube system, the pods in the cube system namespace within our V cluster, there was one pod already running, and um, that was core DNS. So V cluster by default has in its cube system namespace a core DNS deployment, and that one creates a pod. That pod is being synced down to the host cluster, right? Uh, that means we have a pod and also a service for DNS down there in our host namespace, which now is managing our DNS. That means when the syncer synchronizes down to the host cluster, the only thing we need to do is modify the, the pod spec and point it to that DNS service instead of the regular, you know, cluster-wide DNS service. And then, you know, DNS-based communication uh, and uh, resol name, name resolution works as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, ingress sync is pretty interesting as well to even, you know, get more capabilities out of this. So now let's get to a very interesting question. What happens when I run kubectl get nodes inside a virtual cluster? Um, well, it's like always in IT, right? It depends, right? <laughs> there are multiple options here. Uh, the first option, that's the default option, is fake nodes, and they're dynamic. That means what we do is 
we let the schedule of the underlying cluster schedule our parts, and then we see which nodes do they end up on. And those nodes we add in our data store, because a node is just an entry in our data store, right, inside the virtual cluster. And we tell this virtual cluster this node exists, and then we fake it, right, in a way that we rewrite the name, we rewrite, you know, certain things in this node specification uh, to make it obscure for the user what this node is about, but the node for the user virtually exists. Um, there's also the option to not do that, you know, obfuscation and just have the plain node being synchronized into the cluster. Um, we can also enable a flag that will synchronize all nodes from the underlying cluster if we want to see our tenants, uh, have our tenants see all um, nodes in the host cluster. Or we can add a label selector for our nodes and essentially enforce our pods doing the sync process, right, to automatically, um, you know, get that uh, node selector so that, you know, a certain V cluster can only use certain nodes and only can see certain nodes inside the cluster. Um, and, you know, all of this is configurable via pretty, you know, straightforward flags that you can pass to the, you know, synchro container. Um, what else is possible with virtual clusters? It's very, very exciting uh, because there's a lot of, you know, things that you can do with it. Uh, one thing you can do is also run kubectl inside these pods, which is very exciting because when you're thinking about it, this is a pod that actually runs in the host cluster, right? So if I run kubectl there, um, but I started this pod from within the virtual cluster, so it'd be odd if I run kubectl and I talk to, you know, with a service account being mounted, I talk to the host cluster. Um, so that's why we actually changed this uh, environment variable in Kubernetes, so that when you use the in-cluster config for kubectl, it talks to the virtual cluster's API server instead of to the real, uh, you know, underlying host API server. Um, so we get the true, you know, cluster experience, uh, even when running kubectl inside a pod. We can expose virtual cluster API servers. It's just a service in Kubernetes, right? So we can add a load balancer to it, type load balancer, or we can uh, put an ingress controller in front of it and make it available um, to outside of the cluster, not just via port forwarding. Um, there's a couple of things upcoming which are really exciting as well, uh, making network policies work. Uh, you know, if you're creating a network policy inside of your virtual namespaces and that has a namespace selector, that's a little tricky, right? <laughs> because you may not have the same namespace in the underlying cluster, uh, but we can also do that with, uh, you know, changing things during the sync process, and we're actually working on that right now. We're, you know, a couple of weeks away from making this work. Um, pot disruption budgets is another hot topic that we're working on, and non-root V clusters. Right now, uh, K3S runs as root, um, and they have the op option, uh, I think they recently released the option to run K3S uh, as non-root, um, and that will be possible with V cluster as well. It's one of the, you know, most important steps in making V cluster very, very resilient and isolated. Um, and then nested virtual clusters, that is something very interesting, right? You could now talk to this virtual API server and run V cluster create again, right? Create a stateful set there, create a service and connect to this virtual cluster, right? Um, you can see it, you can go pretty crazy about this. And uh, Rich Burroughs, which works with me at Loft Labs, uh, he's also attending this talk if you want to chat with him later. Uh, he made a pretty great uh, video about, you know, it's called vCluster Inception, nesting virtual clusters. Uh, you should check, definitely check it out. There are a lot of use cases for virtual clusters. Uh, you can create them for ephemeral CI/CD environments, any kind of, you know, integration end-to-end -end acceptance tests you can spin up. Uh, preview environments per pull requests and get an entire Kubernetes cluster. You can even have different versions of Kubernetes being tested in your CI CD now on the same Kubernetes cluster, right? Because that API server, you can enable alpha and beta flex, it's independent of your underlying cluster. The only thing your underlying cluster needs to do is, you know, creating pods, creating services, right? Very basic things, right? I guess if the pod spec changes with a future version, right, there may be some incompatibilities, uh, but, you know, that the pod spec is having a breaking change in the future, you know, that probably we very pro more problematic on, on other edges than virtual clusters. Um, you can spin up these remote development environments, let your engineers directly work with Kubernetes. So instead of having them maintain their pet minikube clusters or Docker desktop, have them just spin up virtual clusters, right? Uh, they're throwaway. They can create one. They create another one for a different project, right? 
Uh, that's actually what we do with our commercial project. Um, so with Loft, uh, engineers are exactly doing that, right? They're spinning up these virtual clusters and namespaces. Before we open sourced vCluster, virtual cluster was for about six months already part of our commercial offering. Um, so we already have companies working uh, with this technology and essentially providing these dev environments to the engineers and dropping the local host environment entirely. And what we do as well is we put those environments to sleep uh, when engineers are not working with them, right? So automatically pausing these virtual clusters, uh, purging all the workloads and automatically spinning them up again when new kubectl requests come in so that, you know, when your engineers leave the office at 8 p.m., uh, everything turns off 30 minutes later because they're not working again or they're shifting between their virtual clusters, but they're only really working with one at a time. Um, and we really want to make, you know, virtual clusters cattle in a way and make them disposable, right? And you want the engineer not to have to treat their, you know, pet localhost cluster as they do it today. Um, we see a lot of experimentation, you know, where you really need a lot of compute workload, MI, LI, uh, um, ML, AI workloads. Um, we see cluster simulations as well. It's a very interesting concept, adding fake nodes to the cluster and things like that, right? Uh, there are, you know, so many things that you can do, like have like 10 virtual nodes mapped to the same underlying physical node, right? All of these things are possible, even virtual clusters spanning across different Kubernetes clusters, right? There's so many creative ideas of what you can do with this, and you can really make multi-tenancy more resilient. Um, wink, wink, you know, where that's the kind of like the name of the conference. Um, and you can do things like sales demos and higher level things as well with these virtual clusters. So how to get started? I hope you all, uh, you know, got excited about virtual clusters and we try to make it as easy as possible to get started with them. Um, you can essentially just download the, you know, vCluster CLI and run vCluster create and vCluster connect in any, pretty much any Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can head to the documentation for a more detailed uh, getting started guide. Uh, source code is available on GitHub if you want to dive a little deeper, if you want to open issues. Um, we also have a vCluster website with some information. Uh, you can follow uh, Loft Labs on Twitter. Uh, we regularly, you know, post blog posts about virtual cluster and, you know, shoot them out on Twitter. Um, and definitely, if you have any questions, uh, reach out, right? That's why we're all going to a conference. We want this interaction. And I'm so glad that we have, you know, this, this personal hybrid format again, right, where we can really connect to each other. Um, so if you have any questions, either ask now. Uh, or join us on Slack, um, reach out via Twitter, come by the booth. I'm going to be at the booth uh, right after this talk, uh, where when you're entering the exhibit hall to the right, uh, close to the project maintainer area, booth number is SU49. We have a couple of uh, pretty nice swag, uh, and especially want to point out we have KubeCon postcards. Um, they look like this. And, you know, they're really meant to be sent out to your colleagues who cannot be here in person. Um, so feel free to grab one and just, you know, send it out to whoever cannot be here in person. And uh, since we're a startup and we're working on really exciting technology and a lot of different, you know, open source projects, as you've seen on the first slide, um, we're also hiring. So if you want to work with my really brilliant uh, CTO, uh, definitely check out our careers page or, you know, approach any member of our team, reach out to us um, and, you know, see if we can uh, work together. And I think we have about like two minutes left uh, for questions. So if you have any questions right now, um, just raise your hand, happy to answer them. Thank you.